Hi, my name is Marie Romagnano, founder of Healthcare Professionals for Divine Mercy. I'm happy to present to you our educational conferences that integrate medicine, bioethics, and the spirituality of divine mercy in patient care for healthcare professionals. Because of their importance, even if you're not a medical professional, we invite you to join us. Today, I wish to offer a summary of a conference presentation given by Father Germain Kopazinski on secular bioethics and its attack on human dignity. Father Germain Kopazinski is a conventual Franciscan priest and former director of the National Catholic Bioethics Center. He is an expert in bioethics and theology, having obtained a doctorate in each area. In this talk, Father Germain discusses the current tension between secular bioethicists and the bioethicists looking at issues from a Judeo-Christian perspective. Our faith teaches us that we should join faith and reason and that people of science should have nothing to fear from the religious. Father Germain reviews in great detail a Harvard secular bioethicist, Professor Pinker, who wrote an article favoring elimination of the word dignity and stated that it was a stupid concept to use. An earlier bioethicist, Ruth Macklin, had also stated that dignity is a useless concept. A better word, she stated, was autonomy. The church says that anything taking away human dignity must be avoided. That is one reason secular bioethicists dislike the word and want to replace it with the word autonomy. In the Judeo-Christian way, the dignity of all human life must be protected. In the secular view, the quality of life is what is most important. The Catechism teaches that the way of Christ leads to life and the contrary way leads to destruction. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, we read, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse, therefore choose life, that you and your descendants may live. St. John Paul II spoke often of the culture of life versus the culture of death. The culture of life is a civilization of love and truth and one of inclusion of the dependent where they are loved, revered, and respected. Comparing a society of autonomy versus one of dignity, the former says abortion is acceptable, bringing a human being into existence to be an organ donor or a source for stem cells, denying food and hydration to the most ill, or euthanizing killing those who seek it, should be the norm. The circle of those who are human is small and one of exclusion. The circle of life goes back to the commandment of thou shalt not kill, and we should give food to the hungry. It is a culture of inclusivity and the circle is large. Let us listen now to the full presentation of Father Germain as he discusses secular bioethics and its attack on human dignity. Very good. Now, Marie talked about credits, and of course, you will get extra credit for spelling. <laughs> As too many people put an E at the end of Germain, but it's, if you just remember the Mickey Mouse song, you can spell my last name correctly. And that's how I taught my nieces and nephews how to spell their last name. Is, Who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me? K-O-P-A-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I. Very good. I bet you never thought that you'd sing at a Divine Mercy conference, huh? I want to take you back to your philosophy days. How many of you have studied the philo philosophy? I'm sure many of you have. I think you know that when philosophy began, it began as a secular discipline, and it was begun by the Ionian philosophers in about the fifth century before Christ. 
An interesting feature about that, they wanted to explain everything in secular terms. So instead of using gods to explain things, they talked about water being the cause and air and uh, the indeterminate and all those things that you remember from your philosophy days. It's a little remembered fact in Western philosophical tradition that immediately after the Ionians came up with a secular approach to their discipline, the Pythagoreans who were located at one time in Italy, they began to put a religious orientation to the secular discipline of philosophy. And so from the very beginning, you've had this tension in philosophy between the secular and the religious, or the secular and the sacred. I will use that as our introduction to our topic today, the Christian intellectual, and I would hope that many of us here aspire to be that, though we might not all share the same faith, I think many of us do, and we know that our faith teaches us that we should join faith and reason if you can. It is at the heart of Catholic, the Christian education, join faith and reason if you can. And so if you're a man of science or a woman of science, you have nothing to fear from religion, you have everything to gain from it. Now, the secular attack on human dignity, where does it come from and how can we understand it? How many of you subscribe to the New Republic? I didn't think so. <laughs> How many of you subscribe to First Things? Okay, both of those will be players in this particular episode. In uh, 2008, Steven Pinker, a professor of psychology at Harvard, and it's too bad Father Bennett isn't here today. He might know something about Steven Pinker, but he's actually a pretty, pretty brilliant guy. He writes a lot of popular books. Some of you might even have his uh, book on language, which is a popular, very witty sort of book. Now, Steven Pinker had been a very prolific author. And so what surprised me was when I read, and I think it was July of 2008, he wrote an article in the New Republic called The Stupidity of Dignity. The Stupidity of Dignity. And what was his thought behind this? Who was he attacking when he wrote this particular diatribe? Now, I don't know how many of you have read writings of Harvard professor, but usually they're pretty well-reasoned, dispassionate, and fair to a fault. When you read what Steven Pinker said in this particular New Republic article, one critic of Pinker's called it a vitriolic screed, which is not a very good thing for a professor to be accused of writing a screed full of vitriol, but that's exactly what we find here. Now, this article is easily available online for anybody who wants to find it. I have a copy of it here with me and I'll actually cite to you some of the, uh, the text later on. But what Mr. Pinker does, he says dignity is a stupid concept to use in bioethics. And if you have ever used dignity to talk about the dignity of patients or the dignity in dying and so forth, he says there are better ways of expressing yourself and if you use that, you're silly they, you're actually stupid. Now, Pinker wasn't the first one to come up with this notion of dignity as being a dangerous concept for bioethics. One of his predecessors was a bioethicist by the name of Ruth Macklin. How many of you have ever heard of Ruth Macklin? 
she writes in some of the secular journals, and in 2003, she wrote an article, Dignity is a Useless Concept. She wrote that in the British Medical Journal. So Macklin is actually one of the first to talk about dignity in such a way that she says, if you use it, you are in for a difficult time because it can't be used in bioethics. A much better term to use would be autonomy. And as in one thing that links Macklin and Pinker together would be autonomy, yes, dignity, no. Now, what is Macklin saying? If you use the word dignity, it's either vague or it's a mere slogan. And these are actual citations from her 2003 article. She tries to boil it down I've gone ahead of us here, and I'm sorry about that. Dignity means no more than respect for persons or their autonomy. And Macklin asks the question, who uses the concept of dignity? And she says, well, some people that use it are the international human rights groups. And she mentions the United Nations in their Declaration on Human Rights speaks of human dignity. So it actually has a secular kind of beginning, if you will. She says dignity is a secular concept. Now, this is one of the examples that Macklin uses. And what she's going to do, she's going to take to task the President's Commission on Bioethics set up by George Bush in 2002. And if you remember, the chairman of that particular group was a man called Leon Katz, a Jewish doctor, and he was a doctor as well as a philosopher. So Leon Katz put out a volume. This was the first volume of their, uh, their deliberations, and he called it Human Cloning and Human Dignity. Cloning and Human Dignity. In that volume, Ruth Macklin read the following. A begotten child comes into the world just as the parents once did and is therefore their equal in dignity and humanity. Now to us, this makes perfect sense. I would say to most of us here that yeah, it stands to reason that if the child is begotten of human parents, if you're begotten of human parents, you're human. You are equal in dignity and stature to your parents. Ruth Macklin doesn't like this. And she is chafing at this for reasons that we will soon see. This is a mere slogan, says Macklin, to say a begotten child is equal in dignity to its parents because dignity is nowhere defined the, uh, she says it doesn't have any meaning, and so it's a mere slogan. And what she's doing, she's actually taking to task the whole President's Council on Bioethics because they keep on using the word dignity over and over again in the different books that they will be putting out. Steven Pinker is incensed because of the book that was put out in 2008 by the President's Council called Human Dignity and Bioethics. That's what sets him over the edge. But Macklin was mad because of cloning and human dignity. Can you see the connection here? The council is using dignity. Macklin and Pinker, they are bioethics. Oh, she's a bioethicist. He's a, he's a member of the uh, you know, leadership, the elite, if you will. And they prefer autonomy to dignity for reasons that we will see at the end of our talk. Why then do so many articles appeal to human dignity as if it means something over and above respect for persons or for their autonomy? 
Now she asks this question rhetorically. Why do so many people refer uh, appeal to human dignity? One answer that she doesn't bring up, but it might appeal to us, is it possible that they appeal to human dignity because it means something over and above mere autonomy? That's one reason why autonomy might be a step on the way to dignity, but she doesn't even consider that. And what she does, she plays a religious card. And notice, a possible explanation is the many religious sources that refer to dignity, especially but not exclusively in Roman Catholic writing. Interesting. Now hers is a much more reasoned, dispassionate approach than our friend Steven Pinker's, but she does bring in the whole question of the Roman Catholic tradition. As we will see, Pinker's will do that with a vengeance. Because the Catholic Church uses appeals to human dignity in some of its documents, Macklin feels that maybe this is a papal cabal against the secular bioethics establishment. At least that's behind her thought here. And this is a quote from John Paul II. Methods that fail to respect the dignity and the value of the person must always be avoided. Methods that fail to respect the dignity and value of the person must always be avoided. And notice here, the Pope appeals to dignity, and what he does say to the scientific community, there are some things that you may not do. To the scientific community with Macklin and Pinker, they hate to hear that because it is putting a rein on what it is that they want to do. Autonomy lets them do it, dignity does not. So this is what's what we're working with here. This is how she sums up her argument. Dignity is useless and can be eliminated without any loss of content. I would ask you to consider very strongly if you do away with dignity, you might be doing away with the human subject itself. You might be doing away with what is most precious in ethics, but that's Macklin's, she says, autonomy is all that you need. You don't need dignity, it's a slogan, and it's used by religious people to halt scientific progress. That's her thought in a nutshell. Autonomy is sufficient. Now, we think that Macklin and Pinker are the only ones that are in favor of uh, this particular notion, autonomy, yes, dignity, no. But if you go back in time, I want to take you back to the year 1970. There's a very famous editorial that appears in the California Medicine Journal. And what it is, it's called A New Ethic for Medicine and society. Some of you might be familiar with this. When Cardinal Cook was in charge of the pro-life uh, wing of the uh, Bishop's Committee back in the early 70s, Cardinal Cook read this particular document into the congressional record because he thought it was so important. What it is, it is one of the most important pro-abortion editorials written before Roe v. Wade. And in it, the author of that editorial, and we think his name was Malcolm Potts. I remember doing a little research on this. He was the editor at the time. And this editorial talks about two ways that we can approach the ethical life. Sorry. I must have put my 
must have put the delete on the particular slide here, and I didn't mean to do it. But what the California Medicine editorial does, it sets up the Judeo-Christian ethic, and it sets up the new ethic. And you might want to say, one is Judeo-Christian, the other is secular ethics. The Judeo-Christian says there is a sanctity of life. The secular ethic says there's a quality of life that's most important. One holds for absolute values. The second holds for relative values. One is a Judeo-Christian humanism. The other is a secular humanism with no reference to God. That's what the editorialist is painting. And he says the new ethic will win out over the old ethic because it's the wave of the future. This is where technological progress comes in. If you want to look at an adherent of the old ethic would be somebody like Leon Cass, John Paul II. An adherent of the new ethic would be somebody like Steven Pinker, Ruth Macklin, and if any of you uh, have remembered the name of Peter Singer, the professor of bioethics at Princeton, who says the old ethic is dead, long live the new. What it is, the new ethic is autonomy, the old ethic was dignity, that is dead, long live autonomy. Now, this notion of there being two ways of going about things, the editorialist is pretty much in line with uh, the catechism of the Catholic Church. The church in the catechism says there are two ways we can go about solving problems. One is the way of Christ, and the other is a contrary way, the way that is not Christ. I remember Father Dan just said, I'm, I'm here to speak about Jesus and Jesus alone. In a sense, that's what the catechism does. You can do your ethics with Christ or against him, but you have to do your ethics somewhere. The way of Christ leads to life. The contrary way leads to destruction. Robert Frost put it, put it this way. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood. The old New England curmudgeon he was wrestling with the two ways for his entire lifetime. Little did Frost tell you, but he probably knew this, that he was on good biblical terms. He was If you remember your Deuteronomy, just before Moses is telling the Jewish people, you're going to get to the promised land and I won't, he says on behalf of God, I set before you life and death, blessing and the curse. Choose life that you and your descendants may live. Now notice here, you can choose death if you want. That's your free. I, God created you intelligent and free. And if you want to choose death, God will let you do it because that's how we created you. But Moses says, as for me and my people, we will choose life. Choose life that you and your descendants may live. This led to John Paul II's famous disquisition on the two cultures. He was pope for about 26 years, and for 26 years, he never failed to use this particular antinomy, if you will. He says there's a culture of life and there's a culture of death that are struggling for the human soul of our day. He was a man who knew the Nazis, who knew the communists, who knew the relativists, who knew the nihilists. So I think he knew what he was talking about. And he says, the culture of life is what we're trying to build as men and women of the Christian faith. It's a civilization of love and truth. A culture of death is much more interested in efficiency, a utilitarian kind of approach to the problems of life. If you want to see a culture of efficiency, uh, a good example of that would be in the present day United Kingdom, where things are taking place there, especially with human-animal hybrids being regarded as somehow 
a step forward for science that really shows that they've lost their moral bearings here. Now, John Paul II was insistent that you can tell the difference between these two cultures by how they treat the youngest, the oldest, the weakest, and the sickest. Those were those groups that were most vulnerable. And he says, a culture of life will include the dependent in its civilization. Those that can't speak for themselves, that the youngest, the oldest, the weakest, and the sickest, they are revered and they are honored and they are protected in a civilization of love. What we find in a culture of death, and this is where the Holy Father got into all kinds of trouble with a lot of people. He said, now I'm putting these, these are words that I've put. He doesn't say this, but I think this is what he means. A culture of death will come up with a thousand and one reasons why we can exclude the dependent from our care and concern. In a sense, a culture of death can easily define people away. The Nazis did it when they took away German citizenship from the Jews, and then they took away their human, their humanity from the Jews. That's how you do it. You just call them names, you use the word vermin rather than human, and before you know it, you have a free fire zone. You exclude the dependent. You can do it with Jews, you can do it with gypsies, you can do it with homosexuals, you can do it with Slavic peoples. You can do it with anybody. You can do it with people in a vegetative state. You can do it with embryos. You can do it with fetuses. Whatever it is, you can do it. And you say, well, they're not human. They're not fully human. They're not real human beings. You define them away. You have some very powerful wordsmiths defining away those that belong to the human family. That's what John Paul II devoted his 26 years to in his papacy. Well, anyway, you thought I forgot Steven Pinker, didn't you? <laughs> well, by the way, uh, I don't know if you heard you've been all this, this conference, so you probably didn't know, but the Red Sox traded David Ortiz early this morning. Yeah, they traded him for Aunt Jemima because she makes a better batter. <laughs> And you fell for that? Yeah. You must be a Yankee fan. <laughs> now notice, language can sometimes be used, I mean, that was a, you know, it's, when, whenever you tell a joke, you use language in such a way that it catches you by surprise, and before you know it, you can either laugh. Now, what I think some of the secular bioethicists do They'll use language, and before you know it, somebody that used to be a human being, like a person who was very sick in the nursing home that can't swallow food, suddenly, if, if, you, if they're called a vegetable, it's no laughing matter. What they're trying to do, they're trying to get you to take away any concern that you might have for them because they are demeaned. So language can be a tool that can make us laugh, but can also kill us. And so. We keep that in mind. David Ortiz still belongs to the Red Sox, but I'd love to see Aunt Jemima. I'd love to see what kind of a batter she'd make. I, I bet she'd hit 300. Okay, Mr. Pinker is set off by the 2008 volume that came out by the Cass Commission, and that was Human Dignity and Bioethics. He sees the word dignity, and suddenly he, he went ballistic. So he became a screed writer rather than a Harvard professor, which is very unusual. Now he says people have a certain disquiet regarding bioethics, and this is, there's a certain yuck factor. Some of the things that we can do in bioethics, you know, with the, with the Brits now thinking that if we cross a chimpanzee with a gorilla or a chimpanzee with a zebra, I mean, you can think of a thousand things. You say, Ooh, what a, 
what a funny uh, creature that would be. And that's the yuck factor. We can do a lot of things. And it, well, that makes people unhappy. The council, the Bush uh, Commission voiced this disquiet. And what Pinker says they've tried to do is put dignity at the center of bioethics. Now, This is one of his critiques of the Bush Commission, and we will see that there's a lot behind it. The general feeling, even if a new technology would improve life and health, decrease suffering and waste, it might have to be rejected or even outlawed if it affronted human dignity. Now, Pinker says this, but he provides absolutely no proof that this is the case, but he's making an attack. Now, we're here in an institution that has as its motto a Latin phrase, in hoc signo vinces. Okay, so holy cross, O oh holy cross, in this sign you will conquer. Okay, now in, uh, in our friend Pinker, it's a good idea to prove something rather than just to state it, but he doesn't do that. And so uh, we're wondering about, we'll wonder about that. Now, where's the problem with dignity for Steven Pinker? This is how he puts it. He says it's a squishy subjective notion, hardly up to the heavyweight moral demands assigned to it. Squishy subjective notion, okay? This is what his friend Ruth Macklin had said several years earlier. Now, this is where Steven Pinker begins to see plots and cabals as he's going through this volume. It's about a 550-page volume. I have a copy in my room uh, back, in, uh, back in Boynton Beach, Florida. It was too heavy to bring on the plane. It was that big. And so I didn't want to have to check another bag, and so I left it there. But what Pinker says about it, this volume springs from a political agenda. And what is this political agenda? It's a political agenda fed by fervent religious impulses to impose a radical political agenda onto American bio medicine. Now, what Pinker has in mind here, 11 of the contributors to the volume work for Christian institutions, nine of them Catholic institutions. And seven essays of the 21 are in harmony with the Judeo-Christian ethical heritage. So there's the kabah that some of the authors write work for Christian institutions and some of the authors and some of the essays are in line with the Bible, with the Judeo-Christian view of things. To Pinker, this is very dangerous. We have, to, we have to stop these people in their tracks because they will slow the progress of medical science. Now, in addition to taking on the President's Commission, what Pinker does, he lays a pretty heavy dose of ad hominem argument against Leon Cass, the first chairman of the President's Council. He claims that Cass was opposed to IVF, organ transplants, autopsies, and contraception. So for all of these reasons, Cass is can I use a word that you probably haven't heard too often? He's calling Cla uh, Cass a troglodyte. That's a caveman whose fingers barely scrape on the ground because he doesn't agree with modern medicine that IVF and organ transplants and all the other things are the best things since puffed wheat. Cass has good reasons why he says we should maybe think of other ways of doing things, but anyway, Pinker regards Cass as a dangerous person. He has a problem not just with longevity and health, 
but with the modern conception of freedom. Here's where I was pretty amazed at the level of uh, venom in Steven Pinker. When you read his other books, and I have one of them, I mean, he was a real gentleman. Something about this cast and the commission turned him off. I found out in the course of the preparation for the talk that uh, even though he says that the commission has an agenda, the uh, cast commission invited Steven Pinker to address them in March of 2003. And for 27 pages, you can read it on the internet, he gave a presentation, they asked him questions. Some of the questions were a little bit critical of what he had to say, but it was all in the, in, it, was, it was really an academic exchange, how Pinker went from that particular addressing the PCVE to uh, criticizing everything about it. it it's it's mind-boggling to me, but anyway, he's found cabals where nobody else found cabals. Now, he continues with his attack on Cass. Cass doesn't like cosmetic surgery or gender reassignment. He doesn't think too highly of women who postpone motherhood. And he doesn't think much of women who choose to remain single when they could be starting a family. And he finds all of this not in the writings of Cass when he was president, when he was on the commission. These are in his writings before that. But anyway, he's cutting a wide swath, and so he does not, uh, he doesn't like Leon Cass, and he says it, Cass goes right off the deep end. Now, I don't know how many of you have read books by Harvard professors, but I doubt if you'd ever see a Harvard professor telling that somebody he knew or she knew went off, went right off the deep end, and yet he does say that about Cass. So, I don't know, maybe Cass wrote him a harsh letter after he spoke in 2003, but it just goes on and on. And then he says, not only has Cass gone off the deep end, but he's pro-death and he's anti-freedom too. So there. So, I mean, he's really, uh, he's really given it to him. The language here is pretty strong for an academic debate, I thought. His arguments are against Cass. Now, Cass happens to be Jewish. And so he takes on Cass, and uh, you know, this was the, the Jewish cabal. Now, his bigger fish to fry for our friend Steven Pinker is not Leon Cass, but he begins in a certain way to take on Catholicism. And he says, Cass packed the President's Council with conservative scholars. <gasps> My goodness, a conservative scholar. You know, to Pinker, that's a contradiction in terms. It's an oxymoron like Microsoft works, conservative scholars. And yet, <laughs> he, you know, he's amazed at that. But Cass, he did take the best minds that he could find on these different issues. And if you remember, when Clinton established the Bioethics Commission, he had his hand-picked people on it. A lot of professors from Harvard were there. Cass had the audacity to set up a commission that didn't have any scholars from Harvard on it. And maybe that's what got Pinker so mad. I don't know. But anyway, these conservative scholars advocate religious principles in the public sphere, <gasps> religious principles in the public sphere. And then as if to highlight it, he does say particularly Catholic principles, the principle of the common good, the principle of subsidiarity, the principle of human dignity. All of these are Catholic principles that are being urged into the public arena. And they're not being urged because they're found in the Bible, but they're being urged because they stand to reason. It stands to reason that you ought not to kill your brother and your sister. You don't have to be a Catholic or a Jew or a Protestant or a Muslim to know that. It's enough that you're a human being. But anyway, this is the cabal that he sees. Another part of the cabal, when Cass stepped down, lo and behold, he put a Catholic 
Edmund Pellegrino as his successor. <gasps> My goodness, from a Jew to a Catholic, can you see what's going on here? Now, Pinker is honest enough to admit something about this particular council and what it's about. He says Catholicism provides the intellectual muscle behind a movement that embraces socially conservative Jewish and Protestant intellectuals as well. And this is his real take on what, what's wrong with the Cass Commission. It's actually making people think about bioethics in such a way that perhaps American biomedicine is not on the right track and perhaps uh, there are some things that we've forgotten in our rush to get things done that maybe the Cass Commission is wise to ask us to consider. This is where the first things comes in. And in addition to skewering the Catholics, Mr. Pinker decides, let's give a blow to first things. And uh, he says, some of the people that wrote in this volume are actually contributing editors to first things. <gasps> and you know, everything here is with a big sigh, as if somehow, if you write for a publication, now if I say first things, you raise your hands. If I say the New Republic, most of us are ashamed to raise our hands. It's almost like if you read The Nation. I mean, I've read The Nation. I don't like to tell people I've done so, but it's one of those journals that you have to be aware of. First Things is one of those journals. It's a new journal begun well, 10 years, 10 years ago by Richard Newhouse, who just passed away recently. Father Benedict mentioned him. And Father Newhouse is a Lutheran who became a Catholic. And he said the church should have a voice in the public arena. And he tried to bring that voice to the fore. To Pinker, this is bad. There should only be the voice of Pinker and Macklin and the secular bioethics establishment. Anything religious to the American elites in, the, in ac academia, this smacks of religious, uh, this brings back sort of the, the religious fervor that he so disdains. And yet, if you think about it, most of the major ideas in the Western tradition spring from a Catholic, Christian, Jewish perspective. It springs from a religious perspective. To throw those out means that you throw out just about all of the Western heritage, which might be exactly what Pinker has in mind, although he will not say it. The fact that a religious thinker says you shall not kill doesn't mean that that's a religious concept. It means that it stands to reason and a religious man as well as a secular man knows that. Now, the Jew he mentioned would be Cass. The Protestant he mentioned would be Gilbert Mylander and William F. May. There are Protestants, Jews, and Catholics on the, on the board. Charles Krauthammer was also part of this presidential commission. Now, this is where Pinker gets a little bit nastier, if, if you thought that was possible. What he really doesn't like about dignity is the fact that with it, the use of dignity as a concept in bioethics allows the Catholic Church to be a player on the bioethic scene. It uses that language. You've seen it in John Paul II. Pinker, would you believe that he actually read the Catechism of the Catholic Church? He read it, put it this way, he read it enough to know that there's over 100 uses of the word dignity in the catechism of the Catholic Church. And to Pinker, this is another one of those, <gasps> how dare they use dignity? If they use dignity, it's a religious concept, and we should not use it in American biomedicine. But he doesn't ask, what's behind this concept of dignity? The fact that religious people employ it is reason enough for Pinker to damn it. At least that's what I think is going on. It provides, uh, he calls this moralistic justification for government regulation of science. And if you remember, one of the leitmotifs of the, uh, the press 
during the Bush years, but that Bush was anti-science and he was trying to impose uh, a, a, science, a kind of dogmatic faith. And now with the new administration, we have sweetness and light all told, but it was darkness and oppression back in these days. That was what Pinker is trying to uh, trade on here. And this is where he gets a little bit vicious. The church found the use of dignitary necessary because biomedicine scrambles the usual rules by which the church used to control people. And he says if the church wants to control people again, it has to use concepts like dignity in order to do that. And he says the genie's already out of the bag. Autonomy is enough. Let's do away with this. And we can do away with the Catholic influence on American biomedicine. So caste bad, council bad, Bush bad, Catholics bad, first things bad, Kopachinsky bad, although he doesn't mention me, but I'm sure he would say that. <laughs> now I did mention our friend Father Newhouse, who's gone to his eternal reward not long ago. Father Newhouse, I'll have to read this text to you because uh, I don't have it on the screen. Father Newhouse always took on American bioethics. He always thought that it was a dangerous enterprise. And this is what he said. A growing cadre of medical ethicists, bioethicists, produce ever more sophisticated rationalizations for turning the unthinkable into the routinely doable. The prohibited becomes the permissible becomes the expected. The unthinkable becomes the doable in the American bioethics scene with the bioethicists that are able to craft words in such a way that good is evil and evil is good. It's a rationalization. Remember, how long ago was it that if you did not provide food and water to patients, that would be unthinkable in American medicine. Nowadays, if I say I want to give food and water to those who are extremely disabled and need assistance in receiving that food and water, that seems to be what's the exceptional part now rather than what used to be unthinkable has become the habitual in ethics. This is what Newhouse was afraid of and this is what the CAS Commission, I think it did a wonderful job in urging us to consider that might not be such a good thing to take food and water away from those who most need it. It's not a sign of our strength, but it's a sign of our weakness that we do that. But anyway, back to our good friend. And this is his critique of the concept of dignity in a nutshell, he says, dignity is bad because it's relative, it is fungible, and it can be harmful. You can find this all in our friend Pinker's article. So, now, what he means by it is relative is that some people think this is dignified and some people think that was dignified. So over times and places, I, I think he even uses the expression, in olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking, but now heaven knows anything goes. That's part of the example of dignity and non-dignity. Now, finally, Pinker becomes a Harvard professor, and he uses a word that Father Germain had to go to the dictionary. He says, dignity is fungible. Now, if I were to ask you, if somebody said you were fungible, what does that mean? Then you're able to have fun? That's what I thought, but of course that isn't what it means. Are, are there any English scholars here? If a Harvard professor uses the word fungible, this is what is meant. Fungible being of such nature or kind as to be freely exchangeable or replaceable in whole or in part, for another of like nature or kind. That's what being fungible is. You can exchange it. Now, 
I can't do better than to give you Pinker's own words regarding fungibility. By the way, I want everybody to go home and say, I learned about fungibility today, and I'm really a, the better person for it. <laughs> dignity is fungible. The Council and Vatican treat dignity as a sacred value, never to be compromised. The Council and Vatican, it's almost as if it's the same thing. In fact, every one of us voluntarily and repeatedly relinquishes dignity for other goods in life. There's that exchangeability. Now notice how Mr. Pinker uses the word dignified, and then I think you get the impression maybe he's not so much against dignity, but he's just playing on words. Getting out of a small car is undignified. Jim, I got out of your car. I was undignified. <laughs> Having sex is undignified to Steven Pinker. Doffing your belt and spread eagling to allow a security guard to slide a wand up your crotch is undignified. I mean, this man knows where it's at. He really, I mean, we've all been through this, and he considers these examples of undignified behavior. You, you just wonder, this isn't what we mean by dignity, but it, it's what Pinker means. Most readers of this article have undergone a pelvic or rectal, rectal, rectal examination. Have any, has anyone ever had a rectal examination? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> and many have had the pleasure of a colonoscopy as well. Now notice, he's talking about health care and the different, he, he considers all those indignities that we go through. And I'm sure there's another word for it, but to say that we lose our dignity when we have a colonoscopy, that's just silly. The fact that he's from Harvard doesn't mean that he, doesn't mean that he can't say silly things. As a matter of fact, might actually be a prerequisite, but anyway. <laughs> we repeatedly vote with our, with our feet and other body parts that dignity is a trivial value well worth trading off for life, health, and safety. So that's his argument against, uh, he says that it's fungible, and then he says it can be harmful, and it's interesting that the examples he uses here are of tin pot dictators who have people bow and scrape before them. And then he mentions uh, calling a teddy bear Muhammad. Remember, he says that was harmful uh, use of dignity. Uh, Salman Rushdie being under a fatwa because of the works that he wrote and the cartoon riots in Denmark because somebody dared to portray Muhammad. Interesting. Pinker takes three episodes that come from the recent uh, upsurge of talk about Islam, and somehow he tries to paint that as the picture here of Catholics and Jews in America. It, it just it does not compute, but that's what that's what he says. Pinker, to me here, seems to be playing language games more than anything else. And he hasn't really attacked the notion of dignity, which is, now, I thought I would define it for you, but then I said, I don't have enough time, and this will give me a chance to come back next year and actually <laughs> defend dignity, but at least we can see where the attack, what the church means by dignity and what the caste commission mean by dignity isn't colonoscopies and waving wands near your crotch, but it's a whole host of you being a member of the human species, and as a result of that, you must be respected, not for anything you do, but for who you are. If you remember old Frank Sinatra's line, dooby dooby do. <laughs> the church and the council are saying it's who you be, not what you do, that makes you dignified. You are, now, Religious will say you are a son or a daughter of God. You are a child of God. You can express that in language that wouldn't entail a religious preoccupation, but it would, you would be dignified nonetheless. You're born of human parents. You are of equal dignity with them. That's what it means, not the straw man Pinker sets up. 
just so you don't think the Pinker has ended his attack, he says, oh, I'm going to criticize one more group because he didn't bring them in yet. And he criticizes now, he goes against the theocons. Now, it's interesting, the, the theological conservatives, that's the shorthand. He's using a book by a professor as his guide here. Catholicism now provides the muscle. So what he's doing, he's criticizing the theocons, but he goes back to the attack on Catholicism and the attack on first things. What is wrong with the theocons? The sickness in theocon bioethics, and that's what we're doing here at this Divine Mercy Conference. So that's another term you could use, Marie, in the future, theocon, at least according to Pinker. The sickness in theocon bioethics goes beyond imposing a Catholic agenda on a secular democracy. I had no idea. A Catholic agenda. All we want is a place at the table. Are we able to be part of the discussion? If you ask that question to Pinker, you are, how dare you think that you're part of the mainstream? You're religious. You should get into your synagogue, get into your mosque, get into your church, and have nothing to do with the important work that goes on at Harvard and Yale and Princeton and the real research institutions. That, that's what he's saying. They use dignity to condemn anything that gives someone the creeps. But then he says, this has gotten so bad that the great unwashed are scientifically illiterate. He doesn't use the expression the great unwashed, but that's what he means. The, the ignorant masses, they're confused because of work, of the work of uh, Cass and the commission and what the Catholics are saying, and he says, if only we had unfettered access to all the means of communication, they wouldn't be confused anymore. They would know the truth, and the truth would set them free. And then he goes on, the major sin of the theocons, overweening hubris. you got to like that, overweening hubris. Millions will suffer and die because of them. So kind of lays a guilt trip. You will die because of the work of caste that says, Let's look at the scientific progress that's being done here and ask ourselves, ought this to be done? Let's say we can do human cloning. Is it a good idea to clone human beings? That's the question to ask. Now, in this last couple of slides, I'm going to ask us to go beyond what we've seen here. I want us to read between the lines. What's, it, what's really at stake here with Macklin and Pinker and the California Medicine Editorial and the work of the CAS Commission? I've stolen this idea from a, I believe the man's name is Andrew Ferguson, and uh, I think he wrote this in First Things. <gasps> Father Germain read First Things. Ipso facto, do you have to throw out his whole talk? But anyway, Ferguson brings up this very I think it's a very important notion. When we use dignity and when we use autonomy, there's a certain kind of philosophical worldview that we bring in along with it. Autonomy talkers, this is their worldview. Dignity talkers, this is their worldview. Now, notice what Macklin and Pinker and the rest of the autonomy people want us to consider. Taking human life in the womb is acceptable. That's autonomy. Bringing humans into being as sources of stem cells, the recent president, a presidential order, that's autonomy. Bringing humans as sources of cells and tissues for other human beings, what the Brits call savior siblings, that's autonomy. Discontinuing assisted nutrition and hydration to those who are sickest, that's autonomy. Medical killing for those who seek and consent to it, that's autonomy. That's what Macklin and Pinker, that's what autonomy means to them, is that if you can't practice autonomy, if you're life in the womb, or if you're very old and sick, if you can't exercise autonomy, 
Why should you take up space on planet Earth? That's autonomy. Now, whatever else dignity talkers say, you shall not kill. You should treat human beings as ends, not means. You should feed the hungry, and you should not kill. All of those, what autonomy wants to allow, dignity says this is not the proper way to use science. This is not technology at the service of the human person. That's what's at stake in this whole notion of the secular attack on human dignity. It's not a defense of autonomy. It is a silencing of religion and voices that see uh, wisdom in the religious tradition and doing things in such a way that uh, you have absolutely no limits placed on what it is that you want to do. The weakest, the youngest, the oldest, and the sickest, they are pawns in, your, in the game. And I think Ferguson is right on target. Autonomy talkers think in terms of capacity, what you can do, what you're capable of doing. Dignity talkers think in terms of gift, who you are. It doesn't make any difference what you do. It's who you are that's important. The circle is small of those who are human. It's only those who can exercise autonomy, Harvard professor, the, those that can actually talk for themselves and speak for themselves, they exercise that. Whereas if you're a dignity talker, the circle is large of those who are human. You've made room for the absolutely weakest in society and you have to protect them in life and uh, honor them in law because they are our brothers and our sisters. Notice here, this is exclusive, this is inclusive. This brings us back to John Paul II. Remember, if you exclude the dependent from your care, you belong to a culture of death. If you make room for the dependent and take care of them, even though they can't pay you back, you belong to a culture of life. Does anybody remember a poet named Edwin Markham? I remember when I was in high school, we had to copy down our favorite poem, and I took this poem down because it was so short. That's how it became my favorite book. <laughs> you thought I was going to choose the rhyme of the ancient mariner? <laughs> hey, the old kid had it on the ball then. This is what Markham says. He drew a circle that kept me out, rebel, heretic, a thing to flout. But Grace and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. That's what's at stake in the talk about dignity and autonomy. And God bless you for paying attention. And I hope uh, this has been helpful to you in your work as Christian and Jewish men and women of faith. Thank you. Thank you for viewing our program. Please see our website, divinemercymatters.org, for additional educational resources. Thank you.